Our guest this morning is Dr. Warren Smith. Dr. Smith is Professor Emeritus of Classics at the University of New Mexico. He's published widely on the topic of Latin literature, including satire, ancient drama, and the novels. His recent monograph, Religion and Apuleius's Golden Ass, The Sacred Ass, is the focus of our discussion this morning. So Dr. Smith, welcome. It's an honor to have you on the show. Thank you. I'm honored to be here. Before we talk about the golden ass or the metamorphoses of Apuleius, we have to understand the man himself. So who was Apuleius of Medoros? Well, Apuleius of Medoros was a very complex man with many layers. He was 2nd century AD, a Numidian from North Africa in what is now present-day uh, Algeria. He grew up speaking an African dialect, but he was fluent in both Latin and Greek. He studied uh, philosophy in Athens and rhetoric in Rome, and he wrote a number of works that have survived, including a, an important work on Plato, and Plato in his teaching, which is a popularized introduction to middle Platonism. He calls himself a Platonist. And his apology is an oration he delivered in Carthage when he was put on trial for practicing witchcraft. He was supposed to have bewitched his, uh, his wife into marrying him, and he was taken to court by a bunch of her relatives who didn't like being written out of the inheritance. Evidently, she was quite wealthy. So he argues in his apology, he's not really a magician. Despite that, he had the reputation of being a magician. St. Augustine calls him one. And then when he wrote his great uh, novel, The Metamorphoses or, or The Golden Ass, some people thought that, that it was autobiographical, including uh, St. Augustine, who argued that uh, even if Apollius really did change into an ass, that doesn't mean he was as powerful as Jesus Christ. It's kind of funny. So he was apparently acquitted on the charge of witchcraft, but witchcraft is a prominent theme in the novel The Golden Ass as well. One of his works, The Florida, describes his career as a traveling sophist. He would go from town to town in North Africa and tell stories to the townspeople. And uh, it's full of boasting. He says that he is uh, well-versed in all genres, all the nine muses. There's no area of human knowledge that he doesn't know all about. Now, boasting was not considered so bad in the ancient world the way that it is today. But um, considering that he was so widely read, he may well have known some of the Christian and Jewish apocalyptic works, which I believe influenced the sense book of the, uh, of the Golden Ass. Augustine also says that at one time he was a Sacerdos Provinciae Africae, a priest of the province of Africa or Carthage, which means that he was the Roman official in Carthage in charge of raising money to put on public works, public uh, st spectacles. This is relevant in connection with his royalty to the Roman Empire. And the fact that the last scenes of the Golden Ass actually take place in Rome when he is initiated, or he or his narrator, which don't seem to be distinguished at that point, are initiated into the rites of Isis and Osiris. There's also some evidence that he may have moved to Ostia because uh, there's a town there near Rome that has an inscription as part of the house with his name on it. So it's possible that he moved to Rome or Ostia in the last years of his life. Now, the most famous work by far of his is one of the first novels in the West, The Metamorphoses or Golden Ass. He's an only surviving intact Roman novel. But the Satyricon by Petronius had been written in a, a century earlier. So the other novels that we have from the ancient world are all by Greeks, authors such as the Caraton and Achilles Tatius. What's interesting is that the Greek novels almost always involve the separation of a couple and they're, they're getting back together at the end, often with the help of the gods. Whereas in Apuleius, there's no couple. There's only Lucius, the narrator, who uh, gets changed into a donkey after an affair with Photis, the servant girl, and by the use of magic. So he has to figure a way to get out of that. Now, this novel is connected with a much shorter Greek novel, 
Lucius or the ass attributed to Lucian. But it may be a, some sort of a, a Reader's Digest condensed, condensed version of a work by Lucian. And uh, Photos, the Byzantine uh, patriarch who describes it, also knew another work called the Metamorphoses by someone that's called uh, Lucius of Patri. And that was probably a source for Apuleius, but we don't have that novel anymore, so we can't say any more about it. So that that's a, a brief history of what we know about Apuleius, certainly one of the most diverse and interesting writers from classical antiquity. Yes, Apuleius indeed is, is very fascinating. Just as an aside before we move on, you mentioned his trial and his apologia. What I always loved about that, that work is how Apuleius says that he's not a magician, but then he goes on to show you how well-versed he is in all these different magical practices. Like he'll say, if I was a magician, this is how I would do it. But I'm not because I'm a philosopher. Like he talks about the instance of the fish magic, right? And, and the fish is something obviously we find in the Golden Ass as well. That's where Lucius, the narrator, the first place he goes after he gets to uh, Milo's house in Thessaly. I love how Apuleius in his apology, he's like, yeah, I don't do fish magic. I'm just, I'm kind of like cataloging these things like like Aristotle did. Because there, there was a tradition of Aristotle and these kind of epistemological explorations. But as you said in your introduction, Apuleius, he's known as an orator. He's known as a novelist today. But in his own day, Apuleius was literally known as Apuleius the Platonist. So I didn't know if you could talk about Apuleius's relationship to Platonism. Yes, it's kind of a mystery where Platonism is in the Golden Ass. By the way, I do call it the Golden Ass rather than Metamorphoses to avoid confusion with other works called the Metamorphoses. He calls himself in the Apology a Platonic philosopher. That was part of, of his identity. And more than that, when you give the plot outline of the Golden Ass about a young man involved in a, a sensuous affair and turning into a donkey by magic, this sounds like a platonic dilemma itself. Plato wrote in the Phaedo and the Republic that those who were devoted to the sensuality in the body were going to be turned into donkeys in the afterlife. So when, uh, when Lucius turns into a donkey after his affair with Photos, it sounds like he's the kind of victim that Plato is talking about. We don't find too much else about Platonism in the Golden Ass. In fact, one of the victims of the witch Meroe in the Thessalian episode is called Socrates. And this Socrates is a buffoon who's a slave to sexuality and the powers of witchcraft and is alcoholic. So if this is the real Socrates, it sounds like the real Socrates was not capable of uh, overcoming the powers of witchcraft, like his character. An incredible statement for Apuleius to make, but he didn't have to call that character Socrates. And then in uh, book 10 of the novel, there's an outburst by the narrator against the judgment of Paris, and he works his way around to talking about Socrates again and says that uh, Socrates was a great man. In fact, he was such a great man that he probably should even be worshipped as a god. And at that point, the reader bursts in on him and says, how long are we going to listen to this ass preaching philosophy to us? Now, that in my book, is, I argue, is a rebuttal to the Christian apologists such as Justin Martyr and uh, Manuchius Felix, who were contemporaries of Apuleius and may have known him. It was customary for the Christian apologists who really weren't much interested in discussing Christianity as they were keeping people out of their hair and per persecuting them. And they they argued that, uh, well, we're not so prejudiced against pagans after all, because we like Socrates. In fact, he was so good that he was almost worthy of being compared with Jesus himself. So when Apuleius sarcastically says that Socrates should be worshipped as a god in Book 10, I think he's hitting back at the Christian apologists. Now, so there isn't much Platonism in the Golden Ass, but we do have um, the initiation by Lucius into the cult of first uh, Isis and then Osiris, and he goes through a triple 
process of initiation, which seems to have a cumulative effect about it. Isis starts out being a goddess of the moon. By the time the initiations are through, we're not talking about the moon anymore, but the sun. Isis is a powerful god of the sun. And I think this has the flavor of a platonic gradation in which you, you move from lower forms to higher forms of beauty or of goodness or of holiness. It's really interesting you mentioned that there's not much Platonism in the Golden Ass. But we do have, of course, in the middle of the book, parts of book four, parts of book six. So it's four, four, five, and six, the story of Cupid and Psyche, which is the most Platonic aspect of the text. And just relating what happens in that story, that pericope to what happens in book 11 with Lucius and his initiations. I, I see the Cupid and Psyche tale as a kind of parallel to the adventures of, of Lucius. But there are many that disagree with that. Uh, you had an interview with Joel Wellian, I believe. He, he sees it differently as some sort of an opposite to what happens to Lucius. I love Joel Wellian's yeah. book, but that, that was one, one point that I don't agree on. Wellian's interpretation of that text, he sees the Cupid and Psyche story as an inversion of what happens to Carite and to Polymus later. She's being told a story. She's being sold a sham by this old woman who's telling her this tale to try to get her to calm down because she's like, well, everything ends happily ever after in the Cupid and Psyche story. But what happens in the story of Carite herself and her husband, her husband's murdered, killed by an animal. And then she eventually ends up killing herself and mortally blinding the person who was trying to make roads into her bedchamber. I love that um, interpretation, but I can see how not everybody would agree with it. And one of the points that Valhan made was that Cupid and Saki ends with a sexual union and a marriage, whereas the uh, Lucius tale ends with celibacy. And yet he describes Isis in very sensual terms, using the description of her hair to be a kind of a echo of his description earlier of the, the hair of photos. There's something very sensual about Isis. She demands celibacy of him. So he takes a kind of a wedding vow in his union with Isis, but the wedding vow is to remain celibate. So it's not really a, so much an opposite of the Cupid and Psyche as moving it up to another level. One point you make in your work is that Apuleius is, in a sense, going beyond Platonism. So I didn't know if you could elaborate on this. Well, I think... To, to put it simply, Apuleius got religion. I think Isis is presented seriously as, as an alternative to Christianity. And I think Apuleius is into that. It's kind of left behind the Platonism that uh, motivated his earlier works. And he, he can does still say use in the Apologia Plat that he was initiated in many different cults. Yes, That's a good perspective. Exactly. It does say that. So he's able to reconcile it. But it's it's a... I just have to say it's a puzzle that despite uh, various opportunities to introduce Platonism, if it's there, it's below the surface. It's not at all obvious. So that's that's all I meant by moving beyond it. He can use it as part of his language, but he's got he's got a higher power now. And that ties into your other arguments as well about his criticisms of Christianity and Judaism. You find in the text in terms of your studies, he's like, well, these are imper and maybe Plat and Platonism as well, Platonism, Christianity, Judaism are imperfect manifestations. And of course, how he portrays the great mother in that section with the galley, of course, he's portraying all these imperfect alternatives to a spiritual path. And he finds that in book 11. I was inspired by P.G. Walsh, who argued that Apuleius wanted to find an alternative to Christianity and made fun of it and despised it but also use some of its premises as part of his own thinking. And I argue in my book that Karate, the captive maiden, is a kind of a Christian. Her, her very name suggests Christian charity. And she wants to decorate the ass in gold and march him in a parade. That's where the title of the golden ass. People say, we don't know why it's called the golden ass. Well, it's right there in the text. Yeah, absolutely. It's right there. And at the end of book six. Yeah. So what happens is after she's being told this tale of Cupid and Psyche, her and Lucius, who's in the guise of a donkey and Onos, she tries to run away with him. 
And then all of a sudden they're at these crossroads, right? Yeah. They stop. And then she starts giving this flowery speech and she says, you gods above now at last come to my aid in the depths of my danger. And she talks to Lucius and she says, and through you, the fortress of my liberation and my salvation. And she starts talking about all the ways she's going to bedeck him in gold. And she also says that uh, there might be a human or even a god inside of the doctor. The I don't see how you can miss that. that if if Zeus was in the guise of a bull, then may, perhaps yeah, yeah. this is my god. And, and that ties into actually chapter one of your book, where you talk yeah. about how the donkey, the ass, was portrayed in Greco-Roman thought versus in Christian, Jewish, and Islamic thoughts. Greco-Roman thought t tended to make fun of the donkey. It was the Greeks and Romans that invented expressions like, you stupid ass, or why do you listen to him, you mule? Donkeys were stupid, and Aesop Fables has a lot of stories about stupid donkeys. Plus, Plato used them as an example of sensuality. Now, it was different with the Jews and the Greek and Roman, or I should say in the, uh, the Christian writers, because they humanized the donkey. Balaam's ass in the Book of Numbers is a talks like a human and even is used by God as one of his agents. Christ had the donkey and an ox in the manger, according to the earliest Christian theologians, Origen and Jerome. And so the donkey was associated with the kindness and gentleness of a newborn baby. So Christians had that aspect to it. It's continued also by the Muslims who had a positive feeling about the donkey. However, there were rumors that Christians and Jews liked the donkey too much, that they even worshipped him. There were pictures of a donkey being a, displayed on a cross. Very blasphemous stuff. The Alexa Minos graffiti. Yes. There are others as well. So there was a kind of a blasphemous association of the Christians with the donkey, and that's mentioned by the theologian Tertullian as well, and by the Christian apologists. They say, well, you say we worship a donkey, but you worship animals too, so we're not so much different. A, a very weak sort of argument. So I'm sure that Aptilius was aware of the association between Christians and donkeys that were in, was in the popular culture. And Tacitus says that the Jews also worship donkeys and that it was a donkey that led them out of Egypt, and that they had a, a statue of a donkey in the Holy of Holies. So donkeys were very much in the air. Associations I, I of the donkey were also mean a negative association of the Christians. And that's a great point, and that ties into why an ass, why in Book 11 is Lucius in the form of an ass which is related with Typhon Set in the Isis mythology. And she even says in Book 11, she's like, you're in this hateful, baneful guise. And then she turns him back into a man, right? You're right. And she even says, particularly hateful to me because of the Typhon Association. Why is this important, these different portrayals of the donkey, and especially how, why the donkey was considered quite negatively in the Greco-Roman thought milieu versus the Christian thought, the Jewish thought. Why is this important for understanding what Apuleius is doing with the golden house? Apuleius manages to get a little bit of all of that in there. There are plenty of references in the book to the donkey being stupid or laughable or lustful or gluttonous. All the negative stuff is in there. Then there's references to the Christian belief that Jesus may have been in the body of a human being. And donkey has to be let go at the end. We even find the donkey again in the Cupid and Psyche tale, right? Um, when <clears throat> Venus is sending Psyche on all these impossible quests, she sends her to the underworld. And she's like, you got to hold these two honey cakes. And she sees, I think at a crossroads as well, it's like an old man and a donkey. And yeah, I know right. this has some kind of symbolism. Of course, I know Apuleius can't help himself as a second sophistic orator and person who wants to show off his knowledge. He's like, I got to put this in there somewhere. So I'm sure it's symbolic of one of his initiatory rituals. You know, the donkey is a contradictory character in this text. The book by Jeffrey Benson called The Invisible Ass that 
makes a big thing of the donkey as the perfect scout that you could send into any situation and nobody would ever think that it was really a somebody that had the intelligence that could overhear them. So the donkey becomes a kind of spy into the lower world of the universe. I agree with Benson on that. It's very useful uh, to have a donkey that can hear all these plans and reveal the hypocrisy of Syrian priests who really conduct sex orgies in their homes and things like that. That's what another reason for the use of the donkey is that he's a useful tool to find out things. Winkler would say like he's he's like one of those great narrative devices. He's the reason why you have this floor legium of all these different tales. Because for those who are unfamiliar with this story, it's not just about Lucius who has turned into a donkey. That's the main locus of the story, which drives the other tales. But Lucius, as this invisible force driving the story, overhears all these different tales. And it kind of becomes this meta involved multi-layered story. Like you have the tale of Socrates that Aristomenes relates to the narrator. And this shows, you know, Lucius as it sets him up for both the people in Hypata and it sets him up for the people reading this as somebody who's kind of a dupe. He's a mark. You can kind of get over on him. One of the first things Lucius says, the other guy's laughing at Aristomenes' story. And he's like, oh, I don't believe it. It's just fabulous. Yeah. And Lucius is like, I believe anything's possible. So go ahead and tell me. He, then he tells the tale of Meroe and Panthea. That just kind of sets him up. And then you have the tale of Thelophron with, you know, the ears and the nose. He's an impressionistic palette. He's a canvas. The writer or the relator of the tale can paint whatever it wants to because he's so impressionable. That whole episode in Thessaly is a nightmare episode. And it's an absolute masterpiece. Because all the characters that Lucius runs into in Thessaly seem to be friendly towards him, but end up uh, being malicious and playing pranks on him and offering food, but then not feeding him or taking his food away. Thessaly is a, is a nightmare. It, in some ways, it's the the most brilliant part of the whole novel. First three books are so brilliant. The whole Festival of Laughter epic. This whole sequence of events is so amazing. I talked to Joel Rollinghan not too long ago. He really enhanced my appreciation of this tale. I guess that was kind of like Lucius. I was enjoying these tales because they're so strange and beautiful. But Joel pointed out everybody there is manipulating him in some way. Yeah, Otis, yeah. everybody he meets, the lady who claims to be a friend of his mother or whatever. Yeah. And Milo and then, is hope. And Yeah, Milo. We'll just get into that because you point out Hypata is kind of like this liminal space of magic, witchcraft. Let's just talk about what is the role that magic plays in the Golden Ass? Well, magic is very powerful. That's the bottom line. It's real. I think it, it can overcome the most positive of intentions. At the same time, it's funny and comical and puts you in ridiculous situations. So as I said before, I think Apuleius knew a bit more about magic. The apology reveals that he was kind of an expert on magic. But th that's why he has uh, Isis talk about her powers of the elements in language that repeats the language of Meroe, the witch. I can bring down the moon. I can make the stars change in their courses. With Isis, he's got somebody that can actually do that. It's interesting if you look at them as like bookends, mirrors of each other, like Meroe's threats. Meroe as a Latin witch, as Daniel Ogden has pointed out, is a trope more than anything else. Like you find Erichtho, all these different witches who are threatening to draw down the stars, to open up the heaven, to say the unnameable name of the god that even the deities of the underworld are scared of and frightened of to do their will. But then you look at the end of the text in Book 11, and Isis is like, I think that gets to the, the point that you're making about how Apuleius found religion. This is the ultimate revelation here. The real deal, whereas things like what's happening in Hypata and the stories that Aristomenes is relating about Meroe are pale reflections. The other side of the story about finding religion is that Apuleius is plugging into other religious writings of his time, even Christian writings like the Book of Revelation and the the Shepherd of Hermas, which, which was a big bestseller in Apuleius' time. And Jewish works such as Second Esdras, Second Baruch, and there's a remarkable romantic Jewish work called The Wedding of Joseph and Asenath. What you find in these works is someone reaching a crisis and reaching out to God for help. 
often at night, so they're praying to the moon. In the Jewish works, Ezra and Baruch are praying for direction after the destruction of the temple. They believe that God has deserted them. John, in the book of Revelation, is praying for help in a time of persecution. And the God comes down. Isis comes out of the sea. We were at Cancri a, a few years ago, me and some other Apuleius scholars, and my wife, uh, Anne Marie, posed as Isis and came up out of the ocean. And then he yeah, awesome. spoke the words of Isis Lucius, behold, I have come and answered to your prayers. And I think she kind of startled the other Apuleius scholars over there. But in, in some of these other apocalyptic works, deities come up out of the sea. And the shepherd of Hermas, different divine figures speak to Hermas from heaven. And in all of these works, the suppliant is shown to have been seeing things wrongly and needs a new perspective. Sometimes the need is to become celibate. That was a big thing. I mean, it's mentioned in the book of Revelation that the people closest to God are the celibate. And Hermas, too, has to give up sex, just as Lucius does in the Golden Ass. Although in the case of Joseph and Asenath, it's the opposite. Asenath is being prepared for a wedding. It really is an apocalyptic text. On the other side, it, it really is one of the blueprints, if we can even find a blueprint, of something like the novels. Because, you know, yes. you have this lofty, beautiful, romantic story, but then the other half of Joseph and Asenath is all like an action story. It's really fascinating. Well, and, I and it, it also is like a novel. I love little touches like uh, she's supposed to eat a honeycomb. Yes, the honeycomb. And then she has the revelation of the beautiful man who is obviously an angelos. Well, that's why I quoted that passage from the Florida where Apuleius says that there isn't any genre he doesn't know about. He could have known all of these works that we've been talking about. He was definitely an omnivorous reader. When I, when I first noticed in the second Esdras, that the narrator was being asked to eat flowers, that was an aha moment for me. I thought, that's Apuleius. And, and that's then you did it again with, with the honeycomb in Joseph and Asenath. The second Esdras is one of my favorites as well. There's lots of parallels there. What I really loved about your book in general is how you argue that we should take book 11 of the Golden Ass as an apocalyptic text. It tends to show that artificial divide of this is Hellenistic and Roman literature, and this is Christian literature over here. Whereas instead of like trickle down effects, one influences the other, I tend to see it as like a soup. Like they're all like in the same kind of thought processes. All these learned elites are interested in different types of literature. If you look at somebody like Pliny the Younger, he's telling you right there that I write different kinds of literature besides these letters. I enjoy all kinds of different texts. I can talk about haunted houses just as much as I can talk about philosophical and oratory discussions or what happened at the court today. Lucian is another great example. The Manipian text, that trilogy, I argue, just from my own readings and conclusions, it should be considered apocalyptic revelatory literature as well. Maybe looking at it in a parody type way like Lucian is prone to do. Lucian has a work on the death of Peregrinus, which is about a Christian. But I don't think Lucian knew anything more about what Christians really believed than Apuleius did. He said they didn't have the Gospels in front of him. Peregrinus is really interesting. It really shows that once you convert to something, you don't just stay there. When we read the apologists, somebody like Tertullian or Justin Martyr or Tatian, his oration to the Greeks, we tend to think these people convert and then they stay that the rest of their lives. But you look at Lucian's passing of Peregrinus, he's telling you straight up that, yeah, he was a Christian at one point, then he was a Stoic, and then he was a lot of other things. So these people are interested in a lot of different thought ideas. When I say that neither Lucian nor Apuleius knew that much about Christianity, it wasn't easy to find out that much about Christianity. The letter that Pliny the Younger to Trajan about trying to interview Christians to find out what they believed. He says, I had to torture them. They weren't about to tell me. He specifically tortures the slaves, something that was perfectly natural because people didn't believe that slaves could tell the truth and was tortured. Pliny tells Trajan in hindsight, basically all I found out was that they sing hymns before sunrise and that they have meals together. I found out nothing except problem superstition on him, depraved superstition. 
which probably means the resurrection of Christ. We know from the book of Acts that when Paul preached on the resurrection, the crowds would laugh. The book of Acts is a really good comparanda as well. We're looking at this type of, for lack of a better term, ancient popular literature, because there's no such thing as like a popular class, like reading this stuff. It's all elites. The book of Acts is something that you could look at as a Greek novel as well, as Richard Pervo has argued. There's that section in the book of Acts where Paul and his traveling partner, people mistake them for Zeus and Hermes. That's a very humorous section. It shows you how people would hear these things and, and in a cultural milieu where they use similar terms, but they're not in on how a certain group interprets this jargon. It's the same thing with the lady with the spirit of the Pythia. She prophesies as well that these are heralds of the great God. It just shows you that the people at the time using the same kind of vocabulary, so to speak, would understand these things in their own ways. They wouldn't necessarily understand it as they're saying this about Jesus. That must mean he's like Hermes or somebody like that. You know, a lot of scholars feel kind of cheated by being asked to take book 11 of the Golden Ass seriously. They say, come on, there has to be a joke here somewhere. <laughs> Apuleius couldn't have suddenly got serious on us, could he? So they attempt to find humor or inconsistencies. That's another one. So you ultimately take book 11 as a serious text, whereas scholars are divided on this. And I'm kind of divided as well in terms of how I would view this text. This kind of goes back to the whole concept of the narrator. This goes back to Winkler's book, Octor and Actor. Winkler gave you a choice. He said, uh, you can take it serious or a comic, and uh, I won't object to either one. It's not either or for you. It's both and in terms of what Apollos is doing in book 11. I wrote in one of my articles that every time I write about the golden ass being serious, I expect the donkey to bray at me. <laughs> the donkey always has the last word. Apollos' version of the golden ass doesn't share the kind of brutal on the ground cynicism of the Onos version. But I think Apollos does share with somebody like Lucian a healthy skepticism of these things. And I think that it's hard because he spent the last 10 books showing you all these religious charlatans, like the priest of Kybali, right? And everybody in the text is playing tricks. Everybody is being deceitful in some way. And then all of a sudden you get to book 11 and you're supposed to just take it. This is completely serious. When, when you get a group that do take themselves seriously, like the robbers, they're a bunch of low-down crooks, but they consider yeah, themselves yeah. to be heroic. They tell us tales about themselves and their robberies. I love the story about the guy in the, the bear skin. They tell these tales almost like they're Homeric epic heroes, and they're just like robbing people. They even use heroic language, like when we had arrived at the gates of seven-gated thieves and so on. They think there's something out of a, out of an epic poem. They're almost like Inculpius in that sense from the Satirica. He's a mythomaniac. His brain's completely awash in all these heroic imagery from his training, his learning, and his paideia. It's really funny because the robbers, like you say, are almost talking in the same kind of way. They're speaking of themselves in very lofty, epic terms. Yes, and, and you're right about Inculpius and his crew. They're a bunch of con men. But when someone cheats them, they say, we ought to report this to the police. Somebody is not being honest with us. When I'm looking at the golden ass, an interesting comparanda that I found in the text is I, I believe it's in one of the tales about the unfaithful wife, which is a common trope in these texts. The person who's relating the tale specifically says she was converted to a certain religion that's kind of ranked to me almost like Christianity or Judaism. That's the baker's wife. Right? And that's where he says she believed in the. Unicus Deus, which is meant to be sarcastic, the, right. the unique God. Yeah, that always kind of stuck with me. Uh, and so when I found your book and your work, I was, why not? You know, you know, there's a tendency in classical scholarship and on the other side, the Christian scholarship, if it's like from a certain perspective to look at these things as insulated and these people is not reading each other at all or being influenced by each other at all. A really big influence on me is in my thinking about antiquity and popular literature is Glenn Bowersock's work, uh, Fiction is History, and how all of these things are just tropes in the air that people enjoy to read. Then I read your book and I'm like, well, Apuleius is an intellectually curious person. Why would he just all of a sudden decide, oh, 
I, I want to learn about fish. I want to learn about mystery cults, but I don't care about this Christian thing. I think it'd be the complete opposite. I think he'd be very interested in learning about it. So I think your work is really valuable in that sense. And by the way, since you were mentioning Petronius, I saw the interview you gave with Robin Walsh in which she talks about Eumopus wanting the legacy hunters to eat his body as being a parody of Christianity. There you have another reference to Christianity when it's not named. One of the reviews of my book said, if Apuleius wanted to mock Christianity, why didn't he do it by name? And, you know, there's more than one way to do it. Lucian did his by name, but Petronius did not. And one of the Greek novels, too, by Achilles Tatius, Luke includes a parody of The Last Supper, mm. but, but not by name. Winkler yeah. himself considers that a parody of The Last Supper. Christianity, for some reason, was often mocked without a name. It was almost like there was such contempt for it, it didn't even deserve a name. For context, for people who aren't familiar with this part of Luke P. and Clytophon, written by Achilles Tatius, book two, there's an ideological origin story for purple that is being produced. They give an explanation of Dionysus coming to this gardener, again, Heroicos, we just talked about that. He goes to this house and, you know, Zania, hospitality, things like that. And he shares the blood of the grape. That's where Winkler finds the parallels with Mark and the institution of the Eucharist. I know not everybody agrees with that parallel, but I find it quite convincing. In Petronius Rome, Peter and Paul had both been there preaching the, their doctrine. So that I would think that some of the Christian doctrine might have become widespread during Petronius' lifetime. Why not? Christians had to be well enough known to be attacked by Nero as having set the fire of Rome. That's something that a Tacitus tells us, right? He specifically mentions that that was the reason. He does, yes. Like I said, it's, it's almost insulting to the intelligence of these really learned, educated orators and people who want to learn everything. I'm not a scholar, but like I love to learn. And I assume you do too as a scholar. You dedicated your life to it. And as somebody who loves to learn stuff, you want to learn everything about stuff you're interested in. I think it's just kind of silly to think that like Apuleius or Lucian or whoever, or any of these guys are just going around going, no, it's not really my thing. I don't really care. Instead, they would go, oh, it's some weird Eastern mystery cult association thing. I got to learn more about it. Apuleius is very clever because I, I believe that he uses some of the more attractive Christian doctrines in his work. Even though he's rejecting Christianity, he's borrowing from them. The forgiveness of sins becomes an Apulian doctrine. Even in Psyche, you talk about Cupid and Psyche. She does yeah, everything that's... wrong, but she still gets forgiven. That's a great parallel as well. Psyche is doing all of these impossible tasks, and at the very end, she still doesn't exactly complete the task on her own. She has to have, obviously, Cupid come and save her. It's a very interesting parallel. One of the things that I tried to, to do in my book that has been kind of frowned on by classical scholars is bringing in uh, religious texts. There's a feeling among classes that religion is not part of the classical heritage. And one scholar even said to me, you're mentioning books that we never even heard of, with the assumption that Apuleius had never heard of them either. Just to get back on Lucian, because I always love talking about Lucian. Lucian, what he's doing in book two of A True Story, right? He talks yeah. about this idyllic paradise where all these heroes and poets and people are on this Isle of the Blessed. And then he talks about this place where people are being punished in a way very reminiscent of something like the Apocalypse of Peter, which is not a canonical text. And that's another barrier to our understanding that not only do I think classical scholars and New Testament scholars don't take into consideration the work that each other are doing and the text and where these things were swimming. But even on the New Testament side, people don't take into consideration that there was no canon for a very long time. And these texts in these so-called apocryphal or non-canonical texts were still very popular, very influential. Lucian is around this area where these things were popular and circulating. Why wouldn't he, as a very curious, learned person, hear something like you find in the Apocalypse of Peter and go, that's interesting. Of course, he could be taking it right from Plato, right? More the myth of Ur in the Republic, but it, it, there's a lot of parallels, I think.
that could be explored. Apollaeus is doing the same thing in the book 11. And let's not forget Isis as a deity was very popular. Was very popular and had long been established. The temple of Isis went back to the time of Sulla in Rome. You read all these Augustan era poets, all of the women that they're in love with, they're at their doorpost lamenting for, you know, five pages. All of their women are initiated into the cult of Isis. It was a very ubiquitous thing. It's not hard to believe that Apuleius would look at something like Christianity and think, oh, that's just silly. That's just silly. There's something better. And he brings Isis into the mix. He brings Isis in, but he also sanitizes Isis. You get yeah. quite a different picture of her worship from Plutarch's work on Isis in Osiris. With, with things like murder and mutilation and weird stuff, that all of which is taken out by Apuleius in his account. Apuleius puts that really beautiful, almost like an Isaac pronouncement. Lucius is at the end of his rope, again, driving yourself out to a, a liminal space. He's a donkey. He's like, I'm not getting out of here. He just saw these people being massacred in the arena. They're feeding these prisoners to the beast and, and doing like this mythic cosplay, for lack of a better term. He does this prayer almost like Fourth Ezra. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He does the same kind of like supplication. And then he has this apocalyptic revelatory experience when Isis manifests herself to him. And she's not just this mythological figure. And maybe this will tie into to your the Platonic aspects of the text, like in terms of the lower Aphrodite and the higher Aphrodite. Yeah, yeah. Thought. But like Isis completely becomes more than just this mythological figure. She becomes the queen of heaven. She is everything. She becomes kind of like Eros, Cupid portrayed in Hesiod as like this shattering, destructive force that holds the universe together. And causes the universe to keep growing and changing. Isis kind of becomes the same kind of thing. She is literally the higher Aphrodite, higher Venus. My final thoughts on the golden ass is that not take any interpretation of it for granted because it's like a chameleon that keeps changing. It's uh, anti-Christian, but also uses Christian ideas. It almost seems to make fun of Platonism, but Platonism is part of it as well. I mean, it tells a story and it offers you a religious hope. But as Jason said, you can't really be sure whether we're just being tricked one more time. When that help is offered. We didn't even touch upon it very much, but like it really ties into who the narrator is in book one through 10 versus who the narrator is in book 11. Apuleius just kind of seems to appear because when it starts, he's telling you his pedigree, things like that. I'm from this wonderful family. I'm uh, related to this platonic philosopher the from this very yes. place. And then at the end, he's from Madaros. We haven't even talked about the Benjamin Lee's theory that a lot of the sources but the tales are from Africa. Yeah, that's a great place to explore as well. I have enjoyed this so much. I love that we could chat Apuleius in the Golden Thank you so much for sharing your time. Thank you. I've enjoyed it too.